You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. You're listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies Incorporated and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, our friend Aaron Shaler, a mortgage broker with Grandview Lending, and a new sponsor for this week, and it couldn't come at a better time. Our new sponsor is McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. We are here with one of the top people in the history of the city of Indianapolis. He has been involved in so many things, we won't be able to get to them all in the next hour, but we're going to try our darndest. Jim Morris, who has held multiple positions within the community, has helped literally millions of people around the world, and we're very honored to have him today. Thank you, Jim. Danielle Shockey is the CEO of Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, and she's going to start the questioning. Danielle, go ahead. All right. Thanks, Robert. And thanks, Jim, for letting us uh, delve into your life. And uh, and as Robert was describing you, I couldn't help think somebody who has shaped this community as well as millions and millions of others, as Robert said. So we want to start kind of at the beginning for our listeners who maybe don't fully understand the depth and the breadth of, of who Jim Morris is. Start from where you grew up and kind of just like the highlights of your career, if you don't mind. Well, I was born in Terre Haute, Indiana, lived there uh, through my high school years, uh, more or less raised by my mother, uh, and only I was an only child. I went to Terre Haute Garfield, um, had a great time in Terre Haute, great time at Garfield, went to Indiana University, uh, graduated in 1965, Met my wife there. We've been married 54 years. Came to Indianapolis to um, work for American Fletcher National Bank. Did that for a bit of time, then had the extraordinary good fortune of uh, working with Dick Luger the first six years he was mayor, becoming his chief of staff. Um, had a pretty serious lung infection. Spent a better part of a year in the hospital. I came out of that experience, and the doc said, you probably ought to slow down. But I had, the uh, once again, the remarkable good fortune to um, go to the Lilly Endowment. The Tax Reform Act had changed the dynamics of what uh, the Lilly Endowment uh, was permitted to do and required to do. So I, I went to the endowment, sp- spent 16 years there, six years as president. Um, it's a remarkable place. Uh, the incredible Lilly family, so generous. Um, and the endowment, to its great credit, has stayed faithful and uh, has honored what the family wanted, the, that gift um, of their family resources to, to mean to the community, to higher education, um, to, to the church life of the country. And it, it's a special place. I spent the next um, 14 years as CEO of the Indianapolis Water Company, uh, largest privately owned, investor-owned water utility. Um, and my assignment there was to diversify the water company, which I did. We ultimately sold the Indianapolis Water Company uh, to a, a a great benefit of our shareholders to nice source. I stayed around for a while, but not generally a good idea after you've been the CEO and um, sold your company and somebody else is now your owner. You're probably better off to hit the road. And uh, so I led to my retirement. Um, I thought that I would end up working for the Boy Scouts or the Red Cross or some charitable activity. 
but had the good fortune to um, be invited to be the United States ambassador to the three UN food agencies located in Rome, Italy. Um, Jackie and I went through ambassador training for two weeks, and on the Friday afternoon of ambassador training, after we had completed it all, we were headed to dinner that evening with Dick and Shara Luger, but I was summoned to the seventh floor of the State Department and said, Jim, how would you like to run the United Nations World Food Program? Um, and I said, well, I want to do something useful, and, and um, I'm not looking for an honorific position. Uh, so it worked out that the president had put my name forward to Kofi Annan, and uh, I was able to lead the UN World Food Program, 02 to 07. I, at that point, um, I had also served as the Secretary General's Special Envoy for um, the humanitarian crisis in Southern Africa, the seven countries of Lesotho, Swaziland, Mozambique, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Namibia. And it was a it was um, just a, a very demanding experience. Um, the convergence of uh, drought, bad weather, incredible HIV AIDS pandemic and the impact on all of society in those seven countries. So in 07, I came back to Indianapolis. Um, could have stayed for an additional five years, but was, was just exhausted. And uh, when I came back, um, my friend Herb Simon invited me to uh, join the Pacers. So um, I've been here now 13 years. Uh, was president of the place for a while, uh, seven or eight years, and now serving as vice chairman. So that gives you a quick overview of uh, the the life and times of Jim Morris. Well, I'm so glad you didn't slow down after that diagnosis, right. and you brought so much. Thank you for the answer. Mm-hmm. How much, if you're associated with anything, and you're associated with lots of things and lots of people and lots of causes— when I think of you, and I've known you about 12 years now, when I think of you, for some reason, Indiana University is what pops into my mind first. Uh, please talk a little bit about the impact that IU and Bloomington and its incredible network and education and leaders have had on you. Yeah. Well, you could be impossible to overstate it. Indiana University is that special institution that touches the life of every single Hoosier every day. In a couple of days, we'll begin to celebrate the bicentennial, the 200th birthday of Indiana University. Um, the Bloomington campus is among the most beautiful campuses in all the world, a top business school, a number one school of public environmental affairs, the top music school in the country. Um, it's, it's a remarkable place. The Bloomington campus would have about 40,000 students. Um, and it, it um, is just spectacular. IU and Purdue have come together to form the uh, exciting educational experiment here in Indianapolis called IUPUI, founded in 1969. And in the 50 years since it was founded, it has graduated more than 210,000 students. And most of those students have stayed in the state of Indiana, uh, which is terrific. And IUPUI will grow, grow in importance for the city and state over the, the next several years. It's, you couldn't overstate the importance of it. But the Bloomington experience, um, um, I met my wife there. <laughs> uh, we've been married 54 years, as I said and um, if um, anything ever affirmed my belief in, in, in God, I know that, that somebody was looking after me when um, they brought her to my life. I couldn't have done it on my own. And we need to have, Jackie, if you're listening, we want you on. Yeah, we want thank you on you. Leaders and Legends. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, as she would say, it has the added advantage of being the truth. But 
um, I studied political science and geography. I'm a, a map, map freak. I love to study geography. Um, was active in student life on the council. Was a member of Kappa Sigma. Um, and just all sorts of good things happened there, lifelong friendships. Um, and some of the people I admire most um, were active on the campus and, and, and causing IU to be what it is today. And one of the things we try to do on Leaders and Legends is connect our guests past and present and future. And, and so one of the people I believe you have had a lifelong friendship with who was a student at IU at the same time was a is a former podcast guest named David Frick. Would you like to talk a little bit about that friendship? Uh, one of the things we learned, uh, hopefully people learned in that David Frick podcast was his contribution to this city is extraordinarily undervalued. What do you think David Frick has meant to this city and, and to you personally? Well, I don't undervalue his contribution uh, for a minute. His uh, work as deputy mayor for Bill Hudnut, his extraordinary leadership of the Capital Improvements Board. Um, Dave Frick has made as much a difference in the life of Indianapolis and the state of Indiana. He's involved with the Toll Road Commission as any Hoosier in the last 75 years. Um, he was a year behind me at IU. We've been friends since he was a freshman. Uh, our wives grew up together in Bloomington and were good friends. Um, once, uh, after we both had graduated and he'd finished law school, he, we had a breakfast or lunch in Washington, D.C., and I said, Dave, you know, you need to come back to Indianapolis. Uh, this is where you can make your mark. And um, he's brilliant, um, humble, a perfect gentleman. And he, he cares deeply about being helpful and uh, doing good things for his community. I said, I, I want you to come back. Uh, we need you. And he uh, shortly thereafter, not only because of my importuning, but he, he, he made a decision to come here, and he and Ann have um, been just incredible citizens of the city. And he was Bill Hudnut's right hand for all those years, and um, he's one of those guys that never says no. And <clears throat> he was in, you know, you, you could make a, if something, a good opportunity was in front of the city, you, you could bring all the parties together and make a deal with him and get it done. So this is a special guy. Well, if you, if, and please listen to the David Frick podcast, it's on the podcast site. Um, and if you, if you doubt Jim's words, I'll give you three things. He was the chief negotiator for the deal that brought the Colts from Baltimore to Indianapolis. He's the man who made the phone call to the Simon family saying, we need you with regard to the Pacers. And every time you walk into Lucas Oil Stadium, you may want to consider it the house that Frick built because he's the kind of man who, whose imprints all over this city. Uh, but before I turn it back over to Danielle, I want to also mention, uh, we talked about IU meeting Jackie the next kind of big event in your life, a watershed event for yours, as it was for me when I worked for Mayor Ballard, was your time with Richard Luger in the mayor's office. Take just a few minutes and talk about what that meant and the recently departed senator, what he meant. Well, Dick Luger is, um, was uh, a truly remarkable human being, uh, was my close friend for 52 years. Um, I was his chief of staff uh, the first six years he was mayor, but we stayed in touch every week and, until he passed. And um, th this is a man of a giant intellect, a man of an extraordinary heart, a great humanitarian's heart, a man that... Um, cared deeply about young people, children, 
especially children who were sad, lonely, hungry, vulnerable, at risk. He got his start in public life, political life, when he ran for the Indianapolis School Board. And <clears throat> at that time, Indianapolis had never, ever accepted any federal aid for anything, including the federal school lunch program. And he, he knew how ridiculous this was and knew how important school meals, breakfast and lunch, and good nutrition are for a child's success in school. And so he ran for the school board, changed that policy, and, and brought um, school lunches to uh, students in the Indianapolis public school system. Eighty-five percent of the kids in IPS are eligible for that today. And that, that began his lifelong passion and commitment to uh, eliminate, alleviate child hunger all over the world. But um, his time as mayor, he brought UNIGOV into place. Uh, UNIGOV, the notion that everybody that's a part of the real Indianapolis ought to be a part of the city. We ought to come together in one community. He led the way to get IUPUI built, and it's now one of the most exciting educational experiments anywhere in the world. Um, he had an enormous passion for children. We started something called Upswing in the summer. Um, my friend P.E. McAllister was our chair, and um, you know, hundreds of thousands of kids uh, had great experiences in the summertime of, of jobs and uh, fun and culture. We we had um, James Brown on the plaza of the city county building. We had Dolly Parton in Garfield Park um, entertaining people all summer long. But we had 25 schools open in the summertime, the sort of the lighted schoolhouse program. And I always said about Dick Luger he'd rather spend time with five students than he would five bankers, not to disparage the, the bankers, but he, he loved, he, he was a student, he was a scholar, he was a teacher, and he, um, he probably more than any other member of the U.S. Senate, he spent time with his student interns every week. And the, this is a um, great family, great wife, a great example, absolutely honest, honorable, um, worked 24-7, um, and would always do the right thing as he knew it. And it was, a, was a, a pinnacle of leadership in the Senate and probably as much respected by his colleagues as any member of the Senate. Daniel? Um, switching gears a little bit. So when you came to the Pacers organization, it's probably fairly safe to say there was some reputation challenges around that same time with the organization. As you walked into that, what was your mindset like? And what is what do you think the future of the Pacers organization is now? And what are you most proud of? Well, we, we had had um, some uh, difficulty with a player or two who misbehaved in the city. And we'd had the unhappy experience in Detroit. Um, the franchise, since the Simon family uh, has owned it, has been um, the, one of the most admired franchises in all of professional sports. You, you don't find better people than Herb Mel, Steve Simon. Um, Donnie Walsh was a great leader and uh, much respected all across the country. When we had those challenges, we were competing for the NBA championship. And Indianapolis, Indiana, love our basketball. But we expected to be played right, to be played by people who love the sport and respect it and respect their competitors, et cetera. Um, and the franchise today is doing very well. We have great young people playing for the Pacers, great young women playing for the Fever. Uh, our attendance is, is, is good. Um, I think the community has embraced the, the Pacers and Fever once again. Uh, we have tremendous leadership. And once again, the, the ownership continues to just be outstanding. And so we've had a very good year uh, 
is we've planned that we've been in this building for 20 years. In the building, if you walked around, you'd notice it looks brand new. But Herb has wanted to be sure that the Pacers are here forever. And we've negotiated a new deal with the Capital Improvements Board that will keep the Pacers here, uh, certainly for the next 25 years and hopefully beyond. And his only concern was that the Pacers and the Fever be able to play in a top-tier, magnificent facility um, worthy of the city of Indianapolis and the state of Indiana. Um, Every time we play a game, it's televised uh, likely all over the world, and there's a story about every game the next morning in every significant newspaper in the world, and he, he wants the story to be told told right and uh, done in such a way that Indianapolis can be proud of it. Uh, the Pacers and the Fever are a very important part of the city and the state's reputation. We are the Indiana Pacers and the Indiana Fever, but it, it's a tremendous unifying asset for the city. Uh, wherever you live in Indiana, you want the Pacers, the Colts, the Fever, the Indians t- to do well. Um if our players do their job and we do our job, um, a tremendous inspiration and encouragement for, for kids. Um, and you take somebody like a Tamika Catchings or a Victor Oladipo or a Miles Turner, um, they, they're, trem- they're just outstanding people. And, and they do a great job with, with young people, inspiring them. And you know, we're located in the heart of the downtown, and that's been part of the genius of Indianapolis, that all of our significant capital investments have been built in the heart of the downtown, where you have a, a great package coming together, and located in a place where they belong to everyone, south, east, north, west, wherever. Um, this is... Uh, it's been a huge factor in the revitalization of the downtown, and the downtown's the most important part of any city. I can remember when Indianapolis didn't have a single hotel, and a couple of years ago, USA Today said Indianapolis was now the most important convention city in America, and there are over 80,000 people employed in hospitality, tourism, entertainment in central Indiana. So um, the future is terrific. It's terrific because we've got great ownership and great fans and great players and good coaches, um, great senior management, both on the business side and the basketball side. Uh, the fever are just as exciting to watch as the Pacers. So it, it's uh, it's all good. And I would have to say, to your point about the Pacer organization being a leader within the NBA, the hiring of Kelly Kroskoff. And I think um, in the modern day, having a woman in the role that she is in um, is also a leader in the country. Talk to us a little bit about the pride that you must feel having Kelly serving in that role um, and what that what 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 door that may open for other women within the NBA organization. Well, Kelly Kroskoff is one of the most wonderful uh, nice, genuine, talented, smart uh, people in all of professional sports. She was a great athlete herself. Uh, I suspect there is no one in administration in the WNBA that has been more respected. She was there at the very beginning, who was with us for over 15 years. And this opportunity came along. The, the Pacers needed somebody with her skill set. And uh, to Herb Simon and Kevin Pritchard and Rick Fusen's credit, they said, we're, we're going to put Kelly on the senior management team of the Indiana Pacers. And uh, she's, she's uh, been extraordinary in that job. The players have accepted her, like her. They learn from her. And she had this whole skill set. I mean, she knows a heck of a lot about basketball, and it's the same. And so um, there had been a couple of other uh, ladies uh, move into management or into an assistant coach's position, but she's at the, the top of the list right now. 
and I know that she has heard from hundreds and hundreds of young ladies uh, excited about um, what, what she's what door she's opened for them. She's been a leader on the Title IX uh, uh, development over the years, and she was always so grateful to Birch Bayh for his uh, writing Title IX and getting it through the Congress. Um, she's a perfect lady. Uh, she's smart. She's a delightful person to be with, and um, she will— um, she, she'll be an outstanding example that um, this is a very good idea. We agree. We actually are. The Girl Scouts are honoring Kelly this year. Um, as you know, we look to have girl female role models for our Girl Scouts in central Indiana. So we are honoring Kelly as um, a woman of courage, confidence, and character who's making the world a better place. So we're glad she's in our city. Well, she, she's a terrific role model for young women. She's a terrific role model for young men. And she, people that watch this person, how she lives her life and conducts herself, they, they can learn a lot. And my hat's off to the Girl Scouts um, for this and for a thousand other reasons. Uh, the Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, one of the best councils in the country, serving between forty and 50,000 young women and doing it brilliantly. Thank you. You mentioned earlier we— Danielle had a great question about the Pacers, and it came on the heels of your discussion about downtown. You were involved as chief of staff to then Mayor Luger in one of the certainly top 10 to top five decisions in the history of modern Indianapolis, and that is the decision to both build and locate a multi-purpose arena downtown, which eventually became Market Square Arena. Please tell the leaders and legends podcast audience about that decision and why do you think locating Market Square Arena, that arena downtown, changed the trajectory of our city? Well, I I remember the morning almost as if it was today. Um, I went into Dick Luger's office and he was in the northwest corner of the 25th floor of the city county building. Uh, and I, I said, you know, Dick, someday somebody's going to build a great new basketball arena for our city and for concerts and other things as well. And I said, either you're going to do it and, and get it done right and done promptly, or we'll have missed this opportunity. The Pacers had been playing um, successfully at uh, the Coliseum at the state fairgrounds. It was too small a facility for a major league uh, sporting franchise. And the Indiana High School Basketball Championship had been played at um, Hinkle Fieldhouse. And Hinkle Fieldhouse was no longer big enough to accommodate the uh, single-class basketball championship. And it had been moved to Bloomington and to West Lafayette. And Dick Luger... um, loved the Indiana High School Basketball Championship. He had been a a stringer for the Indianapolis Star covering the tournament uh, when he was a student at Shortridge. He never missed a high school school basketball tournament game, and it it killed him to have the state championship being played somewhere else uh, than the state capitol. So... Um, knowing that the Pacers needed a new home, um, knowing that we had to do something to bring the high school tournament back here, he made a decision that we would move ahead. But we would do it uh, in the downtown where it would belong to everybody equally in central Indiana and across the state of Indiana, and that we would do it in sort of a partnership with the revitalization of the city market with the construction of the gold building, with Market Square Arena being built on top of two parking garages uh, going across Market Street, and there was to be a hotel in the complex. The hotel never got built, but the rest of it did. And it, it started the return of people coming downtown for entertainment and for uh, sporting events and for concerts. You know, Elvis had his last concert at Market Square Arena. 
on June 26th, which is the day of the podcast. Yeah. We're recorded the day of the podcast. My goodness. Were you there? Uh, no, I was not. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think I was there. I, um, I remember seeing Elvis at Indiana State in Terre Haute, um, but I don't think I saw him, his final performance. I I remember seeing Frank Sinatra there at the the last year as well. But anyway, it, it this sort of changed the emphasis on where places would be located. And the part of the brilliance of Indianapolis has been the discipline to build the convention center, the football stadium, the baseball stadium, Market Square Arena, and now Banker's Life, the zoo, the Idol Jorg, the State Museum, the mall, um, to build these things downtown in the heart of the city where they belong to everyone. And you know, it when you visit a city um, anywhere in the world, you you form your impression by the vitality and the excitement of the downtown, the attractiveness. And this was the beginning, and you know the rest of the story. We live in one of the most exciting cities in all the world, and it's because we have this incredible package. It's the most wonderful place in the country to play the Final Four. Uh, we're looking forward to the NBA All-Star Game. We have the college football championship. We've had the Super Bowl, um, thousands of new hotel rooms, hundreds of new restaurants, um, and and all of this, I think, was precipitated by um, the decision to build um, the Market Square Arena downtown. We, we saved some land costs by building it over the street, and uh, Dick Luger was a very, very fiscally <laughs> conservative person, and um, it was it was um, done. We we did not have to issue debt to build the building, and. Uh, so it was um, terrific. You mentioned earlier being chief of staff to Mayor Luger. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but your successor as chief of staff has gone on to do a few other things. Please tell the Leaders and Legends podcast audience about your friendship with former governor and now Purdue president Mitch Daniels and where he ranks in your pantheon of leaders and leadership? Well, Mitch succeeded me as chief of staff for Dick Luger. Um, and he went on to be as chief of staff in Washington at the, when he was in the Senate. Um, I left um, because of a lung infection that I had. And um, Mitch Daniels, brilliant, um, creative, caring. He, he's, he's one of the most caring responsible people I've ever known. He, 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 wants, he wants good opportunity, good things to happen to young people across the board, but he's prudent and he does it responsibly. And he, um, he's, his leadership at Purdue has been extraordinary. And he was a terrific governor um, he set set a high standard, absolute integrity, uh, attracted a great group of young people to work for him, with him. My friend Earl Good was his chief of staff, and Earl was uh, I think one of the top business leaders in the country, he retired, and joined Mitch. But um, it's too bad Mitch is, uh, didn't seek higher office. He would have been a great president for our country, but um, he's uh, Purdue. Purdue has really benefited from his leadership, but the state of Indiana has benefited, and and I think he set the standard across the country. Let me take just a few seconds here to reset the podcast and do a little bit of of bragging before I turn it back over to uh, Danielle. Uh, we mentioned David Frick earlier in the podcast. You will find our interview with him on our site. Also, we talked a little bit about Unigov and IPUI. And if you listen to the podcast we recorded with Louis Mayhern and John Mutz, there's an extensive discussion about that. Um, 
In just a few weeks, we will have former governor and Purdue president Mitch Daniels as a guest on the podcast. Uh, we're very grateful not only to have him, but his successor uh, down the line, Governor Eric Holcomb, has agreed to come on. And so the Leaders and Legends podcast uh, roster of amazing guests continues to grow. And no one is better than the man we're talking to right now, and that is Jim Morris. And with that, Danielle? So we spent a lot of time, Jim, talking about um, just your life and your legacy, frankly, of um, things that Indianapolis will forever be thankful in Indiana for and the country. How have you kept, I was going to say, how have you kept Jackie, your wife, happy? But really my question is, how have you found balance? How do you balance all these hats professionally, personally, civically? Um, and what's, what's, what's continued to inspire you to work as hard as you've worked? Well, I, I thoroughly enjoy what I'm doing. Um, I have good health, and I have a great family. Jackie, a great partner. Um, I think she enjoys. If I went home tonight and the fever were playing, and I said, "Honey, let, let's let's not go tonight. I'm tired," she would say, "Get off your tokus. We're going to see the fever play." So um, she, um, we've had great friends, you know. Part of a big factor in success in life is relationships. And when you think of what the two of us have had, the opportunity with so many friends, the Luger years, the endowment years, the water company years, the UN years, now the Pacer years, um, I've worked with just incredible people, and they've become our closest friends uh, we spend an awful lot of time with them together, and um, we, we've had we have three great children, eight grandchildren. Uh, she's been a spectacular mom. Um, we, we we we've been blessed uh, beyond comprehension. Actually, um, sometimes pinch myself to say how fortunate we've been to to do all these things and do them together. It's amazing. And with that, you have the spirit, um, both you and Jackie, both and the Girl Scouts have been um, on the front lines of generosity of both your your thoughts and your time um, and, and, and philanthropy. Where do you think, back to the beginning of your lifetime, where did that come from? How did you know that giving back was, was so important to you? I'm, I'm not, I, I think about that a lot, by the way. Um, May I interject just one second? Do you think possibly Danielle could be the fact that he's an Eagle Scout? No. Oh. It could be a part of it. I'm thinking before that even, though. Uh, you know, <laughs> no. and maybe that is all maybe within the Boy Scout organization. No. And Boss Richard Luger was I'm going to go with Scout. his mother. Might have had <laughs> no. No. Well, um, I remember the day I saw Dick Luger write a, a check for United Way. And I, I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot from him. Um I, I would have, you know, I, I probably, I, in grade school, I remember doing the work for the Red Cross and probably a few things for UNICEF, I'd never thinking that someday I'd be the permanent representative from, from the United States to the executive board of UNICEF. Um, but... Um, I have to. I'm sure Dick Luger was the. He was a very generous man. Um, but then I had 16 years at the Lilly Endowment, and I mean that's the epitome of philanthropy. And it, it's an interesting legacy. By 16 years, I would have had relationships with hundreds of organizations, and so you. You'd you'd have to be dead not to learn from that, and to be emotionally engaged with extraordinary people coming through, doing remarkably good and important things, making a difference, and you you put that together with the years with Dick Luger, and um, I was chairman of the United Way board one year, and. Um, chairman of the campaign, been uh, involved with lots of capital campaigns. 
Uh, so by the time you're 76, you, you have accumulated all of these emotional experiences, all of these relationships. And um, now as I get older, I, I'm more and more focusing on uh, half a dozen things that I, I, I care most about, that Jackie and I care most about. Um, not to the ex but you, exclusion of other things, but um, we, we would make a, a lot of gifts um, and, and we're trying to, to think through whether or not you're better off to make a lot of small, modest gifts or a, a few big gifts. And uh, But I, I suspect my faith also is, has been a, an important part of that. But um, there are an awful lot of people that do a lot more than I do and are more generous than I can be. And um, But I think you never feel so good about yourself as – when you're doing something for someone else, um, we, we gave money to building tomorrow to build a school for hundreds of kids in Uganda last year. Well, that's, uh, you know, what a spectacular thing. Or to give money to be sure that Boy Scouts are able to go to the National Jamboree, especially poor kids. And um, I'm, I'm a great believer in scouting, boys scouting and girl scouting and what it can mean for kids who are sort of on the margin. I think um, it, you're right. Writing checks, money is important. But I think what I've been most struck by with you and Jackie and just the time I've known you in this role at Girl Scouts is you also think about us, meaning you think about our community, you think about our community needs, and you're a connector. And so you're, you're wanting the best for all of us, mm -hmm. and you help make those connections. And it's not really... So I think that's what strikes me the most, is you are thank thinking you. about the greater good, it seems, most often. And for that, thank you. Well, I think we were put here to say yes and put here to make a difference. And, um, you know, I, I, I've been at this for 55 years here. And over 55 years, you do get to know a lot of people. And you can... Uh, if you pay attention, you have a sense of who's interested in what and how it fits together. Now, you can also wear out your welcome. I'm sure sometimes people see a letter with my name on it or a phone call coming in. What, what is he going to ask me for now? But, um, I, you know, I, I never feel the least bit reluctant uh, to ask somebody to be helpful to support something that we care about. And uh, that's important. I mean, the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, the Boys Clubs, the Girls Clubs, um, Gleaners Food Bank, Riley Children's Hospital, Indiana University. Those are important things. And, th and they only exist because people are generous and are willing to reach out and put their arms around and help. And, um, you know, I was... Um, I was thinking, of, I don't mean to be political, but I was thinking a lot about the last governors we've had in Indiana, uh, specifically Eric right now, that, that they've been so good and so successful and so uh, generous with their own skills and time, and we've all benefited from that. I mean, Indiana is a great place because of great leadership we've had. Indiana is a great place because of Eli Lilly and company and the leadership and the family philosophy. And when we all benefit, then we all have the responsibility to step up and be helpful. And so it's a part of um, civic duty in my judgment. Another guest we've had on the Leaders and Legends podcast is Greg Ballard. And, uh, he was elected mayor in 2007. I speak only for myself and 99% of other people when I say I didn't think he had a chance in hell to beat Bart Peterson, who was a pretty awfully good mayor for eight years. But you developed a very strong friendship with Greg Ballard, who I think it's fair to say ridiculously outperformed predictions and expectations when he was first elected. Indianapolis has been blessed with amazing mayors of both parties. What is it like to work with these men 
and what is it like to be a part of a coalition working in a bipartisan fashion that gets things done, whether it's the National Sports Festival, the Pan Am Games, the Hoosier Dome, Lucas Oil Stadium, the Natatorium, Convention Center, Pacers, the Fieldhouse, the Mall, the list goes on and on. It's, it's easy to think that Indianapolis's future, its its bright future that we all experience today, is was somehow preordained, like it was always going to happen. But that's foolish, and it happened because of a lot of people of different parties and different religions and different races and different genders who came together. You have been at the, uh, the absolute spear point of many of these victories and many of these successes and coalitions. What's it like when you work with people from different backgrounds to pull off these amazing events? And of course, I just left out the Super Bowl. Well, you're far too kind, and you... Um sort of overstate the situation by a, quite a distance. Well, as Jackie Moore says, it has the yeah. uh, virtue of being true. Well, you'll leave it to me to quote my wife. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think one of the great rewards in life is being a part of an unselfish group of friends and colleagues that share a common goal a commitment to the common good as they see it without any selfish motivation. Now, I suspect it would almost be impossible to say that there's ever a situation that is perfectly unselfish. But I I do believe that Indianapolis has been blessed with remarkable people that were were leaders, uh, either political leaders, business leaders, civic leaders who loved this city and wanted it to be special and were willing to um, go to work with colleagues and friends uh, to make a difference and to do it without selfish motivation. Um, and, and the results are spectacular. You you know, a Dick Luger, a Bill Hudnut, a Steve Goldsmith, a Bart Peterson, a Joe Hogsett, a Greg Ballard. Greg Ballard was unbelievable. Um, this man is as good as they come. He um, and the, he became a very good mayor, and he 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 had a passion for everyone. He he treated people across the board, and he's been a very good, by the way, former mayor. He continues to do extraordinary things that people ask him to do. I call him the Indianapolis Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Well, um, we'll have to think about that. Um, (laughs) uh, Jimmy Carter has, uh, you know, many people say he's a better ex-president than he was a president. But um, Jimmy Carter is a man of great faith. And um, it it amazes me that he still teaches Sunday school every Sunday in his his Baptist church there outside of Atlanta. Uh, he's a, a thoroughly decent human being, um, but but Greg Ballard worked hard, and he he had a, a a whole range of very innovative ideas, and he he worked hard to um, strengthen the the place of Indianapolis in the world, and um, he um, he's he's a terrific man. There are a few others, folks, whose names I just want to mention. And if you want to talk about it, then we'll turn it over to Danielle for one last question before we do the five questions. Your point about Indianapolis's leadership, whether it's Bill Mays, Yvonne Shaheen, the list goes on and on. But uh, there are a couple people who I want to ask you about specifically who I know have been your friends for a long time. Um, P.E. McAllister is one of them. And another one is a fellow who I think is so underrated because he never saw the spotlight and that's Jim Dora senior. They were both president of the capital improvement board. And if you want to throw some other names out there for a few minutes, please do. But you know, it's easy to focus on the elected officials and those sorts of people to get stuff done, mayors, governors, but a whole lot of time, it's just businessmen and philanthropic leaders who work together to get stuff done. Talk a little bit about your friendship with those two men. Well, they're both remarkable. P.E. McAllister has been my friend since 1967. 
for 45 years, we played golf together every Labor Day, Memorial Day, and Fourth of July. Um, we're, we're both probably at an age now where we have lunch instead of play golf. But this man, um, truly a Renaissance man, brilliant businessman, um, was the Caterpillar dealer for Indiana, and then they were able to buy the Caterpillar dealer larger in the state of Michigan and pull it together into one company. His philanthropy, his generosity, uh, extraordinary. Um, Lacey Johnson once said to me that P.E. McAllister made it possible for him to go to summer camp when he was a child and changed his life. And I, and I, I think that story can be repeated time and time and time again. Um, great lover of the opera, uh, a great uh, historian, a biblical scholar, um, the, the major benefactor of uh, so much archaeological research in the world. Um, the, he's, uh, he's now 100, and it'll be 101 this August on the 30th. Um, he led uh, the NATO Conference on Cities for Dick Luger. He did the same for the National League of Cities Convention. Um, he led the upswing thing that was summer uh, activities for thousands and thousands of young people. Um, he, he set the pace and set the standard um, for political leadership. Um, he's been a mainstay of the Republican Party from 1967 until today. Um, but he's, um, he's very smart and um, he knows who he is. Um, he's an itinerant preacher on occasion. And um, he's, um, he's been such a blessing to our life, uh, to Jackie and to me. We're very close to he and, his, and Becky, his first wife, and then uh, uh, but, and, and Fran, his second wife. Uh, Becky passed away a few years ago. But great family, great guy, and um, a perfect gentleman, a perfect gentleman. Jim Dora. Um, from Vincennes, Indiana, and he built the uh, Holiday Inn franchise here. Um, Jim Dora put 300 young people through college. Most students, uh, children of his employees, and I, I don't think he ever said a single word telling people what what he was up to. But um, I can testify to that because I was one of those kids. Yeah. yeah. Well, he, you know, for his generosity, he, he was um, incredible humility, um, incredible loyalty, um, great alum of Purdue University, loved his college fraternity, uh, some of his close friends to the day he died were his, his classmates at, at Purdue. Um, terrific family, was the leader of the Capital Improvements Board. Um, he, he was actually chairman um, of the um, first task force that was put together to think about the renovation, restoration of the Indianapolis Water Company Canal. We had watched the success of the canal in San Antonio, hired a fellow by the name of Al Groves, who had done the canal work in San Antonio, and have him take a look at the canal here in Indianapolis. And, and Jim Dora was the first leader of that effort. Um, I bet you couldn't find three people in Indianapolis that know <laughs> that. But uh, um, we were great. We had spent a lot of time socially and with uh, time together. And... Um, he and Bob Bournes worked together to uh, redo the the uh, Union Station and the hotel downtown. Um, he was a very generous man, um, and and, what, and he was a generous man um, that uh, you, you didn't have to ask him to help. He just always 
stepped forward uh, early on and uh, said, I want to help. And uh, so you've chosen two of the very best ever. Thank you. Danielle, go ahead. Um, I guess I'm wondering, we've talked about a lot of successful moments in the past and trajectory that our city and our state have been set on by a lot of amazing people. What's next? What's what should what should what should we all be thinking about that will be necessary for our city to continue to thrive that may may not be on the radar yet in your opinion? Um, I'm not sure I can answer your question, but um, cities are in competition. Indianapolis competes every day with Kansas City, with Chicago, with London, with Tokyo. We compete for investment capital, for jobs, for ideas, for bright young people. And to the degree that we attract bright young people to teach at the med school at IUPUI or to work in the science labs of Eli Lilly and company, uh, to the degree we win that competition and bring the b- best and brightest here, we'll, we'll do well. Every single citizen of our state has a vested interest in the success of Eli Lilly and Company. And Lilly's success in large part is based on brain power of its scientists coming to produce new products and uh, discovery and make life better and healthier for all of us. So we have to be a city that is attractive. The best and the brightest can live anywhere in the world. And so the degree that we have good health care, good education, that we are an attractive place to be, that we have good economic opportunities um, for, for spouses, for, uh, uh, for children, for young people, uh, will win that competition. And, and, and I, I think it's a pretty exciting place to be right now. Um, IUPUI, uh, a remarkable place that provides educational opportunities for people all across the board. IU and Purdue, 50 miles away. IU graduates more undergraduate degrees in chemistry than any school in the country. Purdue, more PhDs than any school in the country in chemistry. Um, IU teaches 80 foreign languages in Bloomington, more than any school in the world. Uh, so... The, the, the work of Purdue and IU in STEM and informatics and, and over time we're going to have to have more and more opportunities for high-tech IT education here in Indianapolis. The, our large employers will just demand it. But we, you know, as we become a larger city spread out. We have no geographical barriers, so it's easy for somebody to live 35 miles to the north. You could not overstate the importance of the Indianapolis Symphony, the Indianapolis Museum of Art, the Idol Jorg, the IRT, the Pacers, the Colts, the Fever. And as people live further and further away, it's, it's more of a challenge for people to drive back downtown and come to the symphony. Now, the good news is we have a tremendous growth in the downtown living 24-hour population, and that's a good thing. But, you know, Indianapolis, what is the smallest city in North America with full-time symphony orchestra? That symphony orchestra is... It's terrific, number one, but it's so important to the quality of life and for us to be an attractive, competitive city that wins the competition. Bright people want good music. And um, you, you, the transformation of our city, we have you know, just so much to offer. But our competition, the best, you know, the Austins and the Denvers, um, and uh, New England, San Francisco, so uh, they're doing great things every day as well. And so um, I, I, we have to keep the sports strategy strong. We have to keep the cultural vibrancy of our life, community life strong. 
Um, we need to continue to have great facilities for sports and for culture and for gathering. Um, we need to be focused on IUPUI becoming even better. But we're also lucky, you know, the Marion story, uh, Marion is now a very strong university. The Butler story, a very strong university. The UND story, extraordinary. And the same at Martin. So we've got so much going for us. and But we, we all have to, you know, sort of share the burlap and um, – we we can't you can't be a suburb of nothing, and and we're we, we, all of the periphery around Indianapolis has been successful because of the success of downtown Indianapolis, and we we need to keep that going, keep it attractive and beautiful, um, and keep people coming here. You mentioned Marion University and uh, the president of Marion University. Dan Elsner has appeared on our Leaders and Legends podcast and did a terrific job about a man who knows his education, theory, and practice and leadership. He was wonderful. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies Incorporated and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Aaron Shaler, a mortgage broker with Grandview Lending, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. We've reached the five questions portion of the podcast. We end all podcasts with the same five questions. Jim, you ready? I'm ready. What was your first job? Well, my my first job was probably working at Boy Scout camp at Camp Cretenstein and uh, 30 miles from Terre Haute. Uh, I also, when I was a student, I worked at Montgomery Ward in Terre Haute, and then I Worked at a, a couple of years at a meatpacking house um, in, in the summertime. My first real full-time job. I, I worked all the way through college at, in the registrar's office at Indiana University. And then um, I w- worked for American Fletcher National Bank here for a while. And then I went to, to work for Dick Luger. What was your first concert? Well, um, <laughs> I, I I think my first concert, uh, I, I think Gene Autry came to Terre Haute <laughs> uh, with his horse <laughs> Champion, and uh, well, that's a new one. Um, he he sang um, in Terre Haute, and I uh, then I remember going to a, a big band concert in Terre Haute with a big band uh, band leader by the name of Ralph Flanagan. And then I went to um, see Kiss Me Kate in in Terre Haute. Um, I thought you were going to say kiss, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. No, that's for somebody else. Um, (laughs) But then my uh, first concert um, in Indiana was Johnny Mathis Hmm. at the auditorium. And Jackie and I love Johnny Mathis. We travel all over the country to see him sing. He's become a very good friend of ours. And he actually wrote Jackie and me the most wonderful handwritten note on the our 50th wedding anniversary. Um, we all, My mother's favorite. Yeah, well, she chose well. And then uh, the other significant thing is uh, on our honeymoon, we went to the Grand Ole Opry. So... Um, we love it all. Good for you. Um, hey, Jackie, if you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? I'm a big David Brooks fan. Uh, his uh, book on the road to character and his new book. Very the New York um, Times writer, David Brooks? Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, his new book uh, called Second Mountain. Um, he's a very bright guy and a very practical guy. And He's a man with a servant's heart. So I, I, I love his writing. I, I also like um, the monographs written by Robert Greenleaf. Um, the, the servant is leader. The institution is servant. Um, so th- those would be at the top of my list. If you could witness any event in history, be there as it happens, 
which event would you choose? I would go to Lincoln's second inaugural address um, with, with Malice Toward None and Charity for All. Well, John Wilkes Booth was there. Would you take him out while you're there? Um, <laughs> Is that a yes? <laughs> Well, I don't like John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours off the record, anything you want, whom would you choose? You've met the Pope, Kofi Annan, presidents, mayors, governors, senators. Whom would you choose? Well, um, you say living today. I, 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 would, I had a good friendship with John Paul II and a good friendship with Benedict the Sixteenth. I'm a Presbyterian. I, I would love to have time with Francis, Pope Francis. Um, I admire him greatly. Um, but, um, you know, if I, I – uh, the, the question – I wish that I could have dinner again with Father Hesburgh. I wish that I could have dinner again with Herman Wells. And I wish I could have dinner with Mother Teresa. I worked an awful lot with her, members of her order, but I never had the chance to know her, and I I feel a void there. Well, the names you just mentioned, along with a lot of the other names that we discussed today, and the literally hundreds of names we didn't mention, and the millions of people we don't know whom you've helped over your remarkable career, Uh, Jim Morris, we cannot thank you enough. And I'm going to thank you on behalf of Danielle, scouts of all shapes and sizes, and quite frankly, on behalf of this city, Indianapolis would not be where it is in time, place, reputation, or success without Jim Morris. And we're very grateful. Thank you. My pleasure to do this. You you overstate my contribution. And, And like most things, you get a lot more in return than you contribute. And um, I feel so blessed to live in this great city, to be a part of this community, and to have so many friends here that um, that care deeply about about our hometown. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Danielle. Thank you. And we love the Girl Scouts. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com.